fourth journal club madam appidana madam fourth journal club on uh, gestational trophoblastic disease yeah. it was to do more about what is what is gestational trophoblastic disease and the pathogenesis and clinical features some of the basic knowledge about gestational trophoblastic disease will be given to us by yuvarani yuvarani ready ha you can sh start sharing yeah. your screen the basics what is gestational trophoblastic disease pathogenesis clinical features will be dealt by yuvarani yuvarani start pannuma okay ma'am good afternoon everyone yuvarani uh, this is yuvarani share pannu one minute ka screen share pannu all introduction of self nee endha year pandra please second year ma'am final years ella vanda study holidays poitaanga ma'am avanga first year and second year mattum dhaan irukum senior months now for the present so uh, let her just introduce next exam vanda may 16th la they have okay seri start screen sharing we'll start the program Uh, Suja has entered. Yes, Yuvarani, your voice is not audible. You can start, ma. Yes, ma'am. Yuvarani, full screen, varla. Ah, okay. Fine, fine. Okay, must start. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Yuvarani, doing second year post graduation from GDMCH. Ma, echo agad pa. Echo, echo agad. Speaker off pa nga. Okay, ma'am. Now, ma'am. Speaker off pa ni ta pesa. Para ida sa online din na. Ah, okay. Ah, ipa pesa. Good afternoon, everyone. मां डबल डिवाइस ला कनेक्ट पना रही मां ओरे डिवाइस मटो कनेक्ट पन गा अनमोर ऐड करना है उसकी जाम रों इले ना इन्होर डिवाइस आन म्यूट पनी ओके हाँ गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन दिस इज डॉक्टर युवरानी डूइंग सेकेंड ईयर पोस्ट ग्रेजुएशन फ्रॉम जीडीएमसीएच टुडे आवर डिस्कशन टॉपिक्स जेस्टेशन Before that, we want to thank Oxop team for creating a wonderful opportunity to present in this platform. A sincere thanks to HOD ma'am, all our chiefs, and beloved thanks to Dr. Anita ma'am and our mentor Dr. Shivapriya ma'am, who guided us in this presentation. To start with, gestational trophoblastic disease is the term which is used to describe the heterogeneous group of lesions, heterogeneous group of interrelated lesions which arise from abnormal proliferation of trophoblastic cells. These lesions are histologically distinct and can be benign or malignant. This subset of malignancies have varying propensities for local invasion and metastasis. GTNs are among the rare human tumors which can be cured even in the presence of widespread dissemination. On classifying, they are classified into benign lesions and malignant lesions. Benign lesions include complete mole and partial mole. Malignant lesions include invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, placental side trophoblastic tumor, and endothelial trophoblastic tumor. Incidence. Higher frequency is seen in Asia. It varies between 0.5 to 2 per thousand population. Risk factors include extremes of maternal age because of abnormal gametogenesis and abnormal fertilization, deficiency of vitamin A, and use of combined oral contraceptive pills. Moving on to pathogenesis. First, we'll start with complete mole. Complete moles they usually arise from an ovum which is fertilized by haploid sperm, which duplicates its own chromosomes, as shown in the picture. The ovum nucleus may be either absent or it is inactivated. As a result, the karyotype will be 46 XX in 85% of the cases, 46 XY in 15% of the cases. Hence, molar chromosomes are entirely of fetal origin. Next is pathogenesis of partial mole. 
they are diastomic and triploid they have maternal dna the extra set of haploid chromosome is paternal in origin hence non triploid partial modes does not exist it generally exhibits stigma of triploidy such as growth retardation congenital malformations like syndactyly and hydrocephaly the karyotype will be 46xxy there is a rare condition called as familial recurrent molar pregnancy which is characterized by complete mole of biparental origin rather than of androgenetic origin this is due to mutation of gene which is located in the chromosome 19q13.4 resulting in dysregulation of imprinting in female germline with development of both embryonic and extra embryonic tissue this is also seen as a result of mutation of nlrp7 and khd dc3 genes features of complete mole as seen in the picture there will be extensive trophoblastic proliferation and complete hydrophobic degeneration of chorionic villi the villi will be avascular fetal tissue will be absent beta hcg will be more than 1 lakh million international units per liter karyotype will be diploid this is the histopathological picture of complete mole demonstrating enlarged villus with central cavitation and surrounding trophoblastic hyperplasia features of partial mole there will be proliferation of chorionic trophoblast but it will be less extensive compared to complete mole with scalloping of chorionic villi focal degeneration of villi will be seen it will be avascular some vascular parts will be present fetal tissue will be present beta hcg will be less than 1 lakh million international units per liter karyotype will be triploid the picture on the left shows the fetal hand demonstrating syndactyly this fetus had a triploid karyotype and the chorionic tissues were a partial mole the picture on the right demonstrates the histopathological picture of partial mole showing marked disparity in villi size trophoblastic inclusions are seen in the center and mild trophoblastic hyperplasia what is that what are all the advances in pathological diagnosis p57 cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor is a paternally imprinted gene which is maternally expressed p57 kip2 immunostaining is negative in complete mole in contrast to partial mole moving on to clinical features so patient will be presenting with vaginal bleeding which is most commonly most common symptom it is seen in the first trimester history of passage of grape like vesicles uterine size will be larger than the period of gestation patient has excessive vomiting because of beta hcg there will be features of hyperthyroidism such as tremors and tachycardia as beta hcg and alpha subunit of tsh they share the common structure they have the stru same structural configuration and there will be features of pulmonary embolism when the invasive mole rupts uh, when the invasive mole uh, ruptures and enters into the maternal circulation they lead to features of pulmonary embolism such as uh, cough hemoptysis breathlessness etc what next work up and management which will be which will be spoken up by dr ramya thank you uh, this is very crisp and uh, very crisp and clear rend rendition ma but i think you should uh, tell a little more about uh, the ovarian pathology also isn't it what you think you need to mention about the clear clear kekla ma'am chitra ma'am yeah ma i'm uh, unmute kekda ha ah, ma'am kekda ha ah, kekda ma'am ipa kekda la la i just appreciate in her and i said it's very crisp and clear small do andala kadagadan mudichita but the thing is don't you think she should tell a little more about a little about ovarian pathology also in this fecal uterine cysts and uh, ma'am the next speaker solluvanga ma'am investigations la solliduvanga ma'am uh, next speaker is present about the investigations and management she will be telling about the investigations yeah. ultrasound features ella varum ma'am okay next speaker vandu ramya will be telling okay 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 sure so benign low la ellame rendu perum sendu they will be covering so investigation filter from features la ramya will be covering oh, investigation so yuvarani congratulations nalla present panna thank you very much
after having a basic idea about uh, gestational trophoblastic disease we'll go how to investigate and manage and follow up the tumor ramya dr ramya will be presenting to us the investigations and management part dashnon ramya present him screen share panunga ramya <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Today, I am going to present the workup and management of uh, gestational trophoblastic disease. I am Dr. Ramya Sakendiar Oji PG from GDMJ. I would like to thank our uh, HOD ma'am and our chiefs and our uh, beloved chief Dr. Anita madam and our mentor Dr. Shubhya madam for uh, guiding us uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, moving on with the workup and the management of uh, gestational trophoblastic disease. The investigation of choice in case of uh, molar pregnancy is uh, transvaginal sonography, which is the most reliable and sensitive uh, investigation of choice in case of complete molar pregnancy because of the um, appearance, which shows a snowstorm appearance in case of uh, complete molar pregnancy. And in case of partial molar pregnancy, there will be focal cystic spaces in the placental tissues with increased transfer diameter of the gestational sac. Mostly the partial molar pregnancy will be misdiagnosed as missed abortion. Usually partial more present to us with uh, um, abs and FSH. So we may confuse it with as uh, missed abortion. So the definitive diagnosis for a molar pregnancy is histopathological examination and immunostraining the um, histopathological specimen, which is uh, by uh, tip to uh, immunostraining gene. Uh, straining, uh, which is already explained, uh, and what are all the three of evaluation be done in the case of molar pregnancy? Anyway, the treatment of uh, choice in case of molar pregnancy is suction and evacuation. Before proceeding with the suction and evacuation, we have to evaluate the patient with the CBC, RFT, LFT. This is basically an investigation. So, patient usually present to us with a bleeding PVC. So, they may have anemia. So, anemia correction is the foremost in the uh, management in any operative procedures. The second investigation of choice, we do serum beta HCG in all cases of uh, molar pregnancy because this serum beta HCG level will act as a baseline serum beta HCG levels after a uh, suction evacuation for follow by which we can uh, diagnose a patient earlier uh, who is uh, progressing to gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. And third investigation is thyroid function test. Uh, mostly patient uh, will uh, will not present to us as hyperthyroidism, but sometimes they may be having subclinical hyperthyroidism, which is diagnosed by thyroid function test because um, beta HCG will, um, be, be, the hormone beta HCG shares alpha subunit with the thyroid stimulating hormone. So there may be increased T3 and T4 levels. So before evacuation, we will do follow up, we do pre operative evaluation with the thyroid function test. So we can diagnose the hyperthyroidism at the earliest because during evacuation, uh, while the time of in uh, induction or during uh, 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 giving anesthesia, patient may be going for thyroid stones. So prevent, uh, to prevent these complications, so we, before itself, we do thyroid function test. So we can administer beta blockers uh, at the foremost. And another investigation, we do chest X-rays because the most common organ to be uh, metastasized in the case of a gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is a chest uh, lungs. So we have to do chest X-rays to see the cannonball appearance in uh, chest X-rays. But uh, the management of choice, always the treatment of choice in case of uh, molar pregnancy, suction and evacuation. It is usually done under general anesthesia, ideally performed with ultrasound guidance. And it is we usually recommend the use of uh, 12 to 14 mm suction cannulas. Whether to use PGE1 analogs in case of molar pregnancy, yes, it can be used for cervical ripening 
routine curettage after evacuation is not usually warranted. Usually after one week to check for the completeness of evacuation. If there is evidence of residual schedule, curettage can be performed. Medical induction and hysterectomy are usually not recommended because of increased risk of uh, uh, progression of GTT to GTN is there. So usually we do not uh, recommend the hysterectomy in cases of uh, molar pregnancy, sir. So what about the role of hysterectomy in case of uh, molar pregnancy? Uh, it is usually not done. If the patient with the desire surgical sterilization, hysterectomy may be performed with the mole institutes. But anyway, hysterectomy does not prevent the metastasis. Therefore, the patient will be requiring follow up with the beta HCG levels even after hysterectomy. The ovaries um, may, should be preserved at the time of uh, surgery, even in the presence of fecal uteruses, because the fecal uteruses will regress on its own after evacuation. And uh, moving on with the role of prophylactic chemotherapy, it is usually not given. The long-term prognosis for the woman with hydrophomol is not included with the prophylactic chemotherapy because only about 20% cases of GTD are going to present to us with 20 GTN. So it is usually not recommended, but it can be used in high-risk cases where the follow-up are unavailable, like patient may be having HCG more than 1 lakh, or excess uterine enlargement, or the fecal uterus is more than six centimeters in diameter. Patient who are not uh, in our follow-up, uh, whose follow-up is not unavailable, we can uh, start up with the prophylactic chemotherapy. So why not to use oxytocin or prostaglandin in the cases of molar pregnancy? Because uh, using oxytocin before uh, evacuation may cause forceful uterine contractions, may lead to migration of vesicles into the maternal circulation, and may result in pulmonary embolism. So patient may present to us with a dyspnea. It will, be, it will become a medical emergency. So we do not prefer oxytocin or prostaglandin before evacuation. But we prefer oxytocin in the cases of post-evacuation. It, it has excessive uh, bleeding TV following evacuation we can use oxytocin and uh, follow up of the molar pregnancies usually molar after the suction and evacuation we follow up the cases with beta hcg levels why we are following the cases with beta hcg because 20 percent patient of gtd have a risk of uh, pro pro progressing to gtn hence we follow up the cases with beta beta hcg levels so weekly determination of beta hcg levels until these levels are normal for three consecutive weeks followed by monthly values until normal for six weeks we are going to monitor the patient average times of the first normal HCG post evacuation in case of partial mole it is seven weeks and in case of complete mole it is usually by nine weeks so until the follow-up and the beta HCG becomes normal we, we are going to keep the patient on any one type of contraception usually we prefer oral contraceptive pills during the follow-up period but anyway, we are not going to add give oral contraceptive pills until the HCG reverts to normal level because these OC pills may act as a growth factor for the topoplastic tissues. So once the beta HCG levels has become normal, then only we are going to give the uh, patient the uh, oral contraceptive pills. The intrauterine contraceptive device should not be used. It is usually contraindicated because it has high risk of uterine perforation. What about the anti-D prophylaxis in the cases of uh, molar pregnancies? It is usually not required in the case of complete mole because of the poor vascularization of the chorionic pill and the absence of anti-D, but it is required in the case of partial mole due to the presence of RBCs. Anyway, we are going to give anti-D prophylaxis in any cases of molar pregnancy because uh, we are going to confirm, it, uh, confirm the complete mole or a partial mole only by histopathological examination, which will uh, we'll get the result only by four to five days. So before that, we are going to give anti-D prophylaxis for any type of molar pregnancy. And some special case scenarios present with molar pregnancy or thyrotoxicosis. We already said uh, the, the alpha subunit of the beta HCG shares the same uh, symmetrical uh, structure with the, uh, the thyroid function, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone. Hence, the, the, it will produce increased T3 and T4 levels. So, clinically evident hyperthyroidism is evident only in 7% of patients with complete molar pregnancy. Hence, the diagnosis confirmed is uh, confirmed with reduction of serum T3 and T4 levels. Clinical evidence of hyperthyroidism is very, very rare. But anesthesia or surgery may precipitate the thyroid storm. Thus, if hyperthyroidism is suspected before the induction of anesthesia, beta blockers should be administered. What about the thecal latent systems present with the molar pregnancy? A prominent thecal latent system of ovary system molds to common with the complete molds about six centimeter in diameter. They are usually result from the high levels of serum beta HCG levels, which causes a ovarian hyperstimulation. So, cause which will cause a cyst to enlarge. It uh, 
we should not do cystectomy in the cases of uh, thickal uterine cyst uh, in case of molar pregnancy because it will reverse on its own once uh, we have done suction and evacuation and beta HCG levels become normal. But surgery is indicated only in the case of twisted ovarian cyst, which is a medical emergency. Anyway, we are going to operate in those cases. In the rate of recurrence, what is the rate of recurrence in the case of uh, molar pregnancy? It is about 2% if if the patient has history of one prior molar pregnancy and 20% in the, in the cases uh, with the two prior molar pregnancy. So what is the risk of developing GTM following gestational trophoblastic disease? It is about 15 to 20% in the case of complete molar pregnancy and 1 to 5% in the case of partial molar pregnancy. So another special case scenario is twin molar pregnancy. Where the woman is diagnosed with combined molar pregnancy and a viable twin. It is usually patient is counseled in the cases to terminate the pregnancy because they have an increased risk of fetal loss about 40% and premature birth about 36% and patient will present earlier with the features of preeclampsia about 20%. Again, it is usually uh, indicated to terminate the pregnancy. Before termination, we have to think about two differential diagnoses in the case of pin molar pregnancy. The one is a partial molar pregnancy where they have the um, trophoblastic uh, cystic tissues with the uh, Life with a dead fetus, and another one is mesenchymal hypertasia of placenta. To differentiate partial molar pregnancy and twin molar pregnancy, we do a pre invasive diagnostic test uh, with the chorionicular sampling where you, we can do immunostaining and we can diagnose uh, between twin molar and partial molar pregnancy. But in the case of mesenchymal hyperplasia, uh, we confirm the diagnosis between the twin molar and the mesenchymal hyperplasia placenta by MRE. Because mesenchymal hyperplasia is it is not an indication to terminate the pregnancy where the outcome is very good. Uh, is, uh, good uh, so hence uh, we do MRI to differentiate between molar and the uh, twin molar and the mesenchymal hyperplasia placenta. Thank you. Thank you, Ramya. Chitra ma'am. Uh, yeah, I was... Also, some practical points, Matu, I will tell. Like, uh, thyroid uh, function test is essential before uh, T3, T4, not TSH, has to be done before uh, planning for surgery. And uh, X ray also has to be taken prior to surgery since we have a benign embolization, very common. And the basal curating, uh, usually asked question is whether we should take a basal curating in all cases of vesicular hormone. It is not necessary because we are going to follow her up with HCG. So instead of uh, doing a basal curating and causing a perforation, it's not necessary. And uh, oxytocin also should not be used before uh, doing uh, curatage. Some, some people have the habit of starting a 20 unit syntocinone before uh, doing the curatage for an easy evacuation, but that should not be practiced. While doing evacuation, after starting our suction, we can start oxytocin. Because benign emboli causing a, a, a emergency is very common uh, in a vesicular hormone. So we should not uh, ourselves induce a uh, embolization. Chitra, madam? Yeah, uh, I think uh, that is about all. But uh, the patient is that is progressing on to molar and the follow up of the molar pregnancy. With usually, we do it uh, serial HCG monitoring levels. At what uh, interval do they do the monitoring of HCG level for the initial follow-up? Ramya, on the slide, I'm going to go to the Follow-up HCG. Follow-up. Where there are no facilities or the patient is very poor, no? And so making them do... Madam, it sound clear as yeah. a No? No, what I'm saying is instead of doing, making them do a beta HCG every week or uh, uh, according to protocol when they're doing, if the patient is not uh, affordable or anything like that, we can ask them to do urine uh, pregnancy test. And uh, if it, uh, as long as it is positive, you have to keep on checking her serum levels also. Once the urine is negative, Naka, we can stop doing uh, Leah yeah, to save uh, patient uh, financially. Oh, madam, in a soldrangana, urine HCG positive, I didn't have a two serum HCG panicula. So, uh, would a Namakonda threshold level, urine HCG positive are 
so we have to do a urine hcg when it is negative it is not not necessary to do serum hcg in run new point for us because but over two three times a day we hcg paathiradhu better illa madam to diagnose uh, uh, increasing levels ana yeah. urine hcg positive a irundhalu serum hcg paaka but that, that is not going to be that much costly ma'am 250 avula da aagapodu hcg paakaradhu adha nama op op la that's what i do upt paathittu odane report vandirudhu if it is negative we tell them to come after one month okay Hello. okay தேவனா மட்டும் ultrasound. we do the other way because op la ukanda just or a probe potu paathu cavity empty na illa ultrasound oda beta hcg is reliable even when there is ultrasound features is absent beta hcg is high we suspect uh, no no for your patient calling beta hcg uh, we do it in this order if the cavity is empty and upt is negative we tell them to come after one okay. when you are doing upt it's okay uh, yeah upt Uh, along with the uh, just an ultrasound probe which you pack at is no harm okay because information at the tip of the finger and it's immediate okay ma'am that okay beta hcg packa the patient ku na upt paathukrom in the mail here after we will see that thank you ma'am okay. so we'll we'll go to the next presenter ma'am shivapriya she is going to present to us about the gestational trophoblastic neoplasia malignant form of trophoblastic disease so priya yes madam is it visible madam full screen varla shivapriya madam now is it visible madam okay, okay you start start presenting shivapriya it's visible yes madam thank you madam Uh, good evening on and all now i'm here to talk on gestational trophoblastic neoplasm so these are the malignant lesions arising from the placental villus as well as extra villus trophoblastic layers and the incidence is noted to be 9 in 40000 pregnancies and gtn is more common in asian countries the best point in gtn is that the cure rate approaches about 100% and it allows fertility preservation uh it includes invasive mole choriocarcinoma placental site trophoblastic tumor epithelial trophoblastic tumor and another entity is called atypical placental site nodule this may coexist with or it may develop into either pstt or edt so uh, seeing this is the invasive mole and choriocarcinoma they are more common in nature and they arise from the villus trophoblast that is cytotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast so they produce high amounts of hcg 
and they are chemosensitive and they have propensity for hematogenous spread and here since they are chemosensitive the chemotherapy will be the primary modality of treatment whereas pstt and ett they are conclusively called as itt that is inter intermediate trophoblastic tumors so these are very rare entities and they arise from the extravellus that is intermediate trophoblast and so they produce very scant amount of hcg and hence they are chemo resistant so these have propensity for lymphatic spread and here since they are chemo resistant surgery will be the primary modality of treatment gtn it can follow a molar pregnancy or a non molar so post molar gtn accounts for about 50% whereas non molar it can occur from a miscarriage or a tubal ectopic or even from a term or preterm pregnancy and gtn can be non metastatic like locally invasive or it can be metastatic to distant metastasis sites coming to post molar gtn so it is usually diagnosed by the hcg surveillance following a molar evacuation uh, usually they present without symptoms just by hcg surveillance we diagnose without uh, symptoms and without histological verification and as already said the complete mole has greater propensity to develop into a gtn about 15 to 20% of complete mole whereas 1 to 5% of the partial mole they develop eventually into gtn and and most commonly the invasive mole and choriocarcinoma they follow molar pregnancies whereas pstt and itt uh, they follow non molar pregnancies so uh, invasive mole it is characterized by uh, myometrial invasion of the trophoblastic proliferations and it is usually self limited confined to wait, confined to the uterus and they very rarely metastasizes whereas gestation choriocarcinoma is on the opposite side it is a pure epithelial malignancy arising from both villus axillus extravillus trophoblast and they follow um, a quick spread and early systemic metastasis occurs there may be areas of necrosis hemorrhage and uh, market aneuploidy and high mitotic index is observed in gestation choriocarcinoma and this is the figo criteria for diagnosing a post molar gtn so one is by hcg surveillance and another is by histological ver uh, verification so uh, when we do hcg surveillance so when there is a plateau level uh, achieved over um, four values over three weeks so that is on day 1 day 7 14 and 21 when we observe there will be a plateauing of the hcg levels or it can be a hcg rise of uh, three values over two weeks that is on day 1 7 and 14 or it can be a hcg persistence more than 6 months or histological diagnosis so these are the criteria for diagnosing a post molar gtn coming to non molar as i already told the pstt and ett they mostly follow the non molar pregnancies and sometimes gestation choriocarcinoma can also follow non molar pregnancy so uh, this itt tumors they uh, the diagnosis is mainly by histological so either after a hysterectomy specimen or a cervix biopsy or a curettage specimen and uh, pstt it uh, we already saw that since it arises from the intermediate trophoblast it uh, produces very scant amounts of hcg so uh, we can diagnose it with positive staining for a uh, human placenta lactogen and some uh, you know chemical stains like melcam and cytokeratin and ett uh, it is usually arise from the cervix or lower uterine segment and then it invades deeply so it is often mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma and these are very slow growing and have lymphatic spread uh, when compared with gestation choriocarcinoma so a uh, non molar gtn so how it will present so uh, uh, it may present with very subtle signs and symptoms so the diagnosis is of uh, very uh, difficult to be made so uh, the uh, any persistent or irregular vaginal bleeding that occurs after a pregnancy even we can think on uh, gtn so rcg says that a urine hcg test should be performed in all cases of persistent or irregular vaginal bleeding more than 8 weeks after a pregnancy even and coming to metastatic gtn the, uh, these follow often the non molar pregnancies so they will be more uh, more often metastasized so the lungs are the most common site of metastasis accounting for 80% and um, the next uh, in order will be vagina and pelvis where there is uh, 30 to 20% and uh, the distant metastasis uh, sites which uh, which are occurring in the high risk pattern like liver and brain metastasis accounting for 10 10% consecutively 
and then uh, it can also uh, metastasis in a very uh, least amount or about less than 1% to uh, spleen, kidneys and GI tract. So coming to the workup of GTN, so we need to, uh, so since we know that the chemotherapy is the main modality of treatment, so uh, we need to uh, have a baseline uh, investigations like complete blood count, uh, renal function test and liver function test and thyroid function test. And we need to uh, account initial HCG level. And also uh, since uh, metastasis may, um, may result in a bleeding, so we, uh, we need to do a blood grouping and typing and coagulation profile. And next comes the metastatic workup. So that, uh, that can be done by pelvic Doppler ultrasound, CT abdomen or pelvis, uh, chest X-ray or CT chest and MRA brain. So after doing this investigational uh, workups, so uh, for managing a GTN, we need to stage the GTN and also give a prognostic scoring. So FIGO has uh, given a staging, that is an anatomical staging for GTN. So we have four stages. So stage one, when it is strictly confined to the uterus, and stage two will be to the adnexa and to the vaginal uh, vagina. And stage three, it will be to the pulmonary metastasis with or without genital tract involvement. And stage four for the distant metastasis, more commonly liver and brain. And this is the uh, prognostic scoring uh, given by WHO and also accepted by FIGO uh, in 2000 for uh, GTN management. So here we have many parameters like age in years, antecedent pregnancy, uh, what kind of pregnancy it is uh, followed with and uh, uh, interval from the pregnancy even to the start of the treatment in months and pre-treatment serum HCG levels and the largest tumor size uh, in centimeter and site of metastasis, number of metastasis and when there is a previous failed chemotherapy, whether with a single drug or a multi-drug. So we give scores of 0, 1, 2 and 4 uh, based on these patterns. So we know we already saw that uh, the GTN as a molar pregnancy it is more common in older age group. So here the age more than 40, we give the score of 1 and for uh, preceding the antecedent pregnancy. Uh, so in case of uh, molar GTN, uh, the metastasis will be very less. But post-molar, it will lead to metastatic GTN and high-risk complications. So, uh, molar, when the antecedent pregnancy is mole, we give the score of zero, whereas for abortion, we give one, and for term pregnancies, we give the score of two. And uh, the month interval, so uh, accordingly, less than four, four to seven, seven to 13 months, and more than 13 months. And uh, pre-treatment serum HCG in international units per liter. So, when uh, less than 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 1 lakh, and more than 1 lakh. And tumor size, uh, it is less than three centimeter, three to five and more than five uh, from uh, score zero to two. And the site of metastasis, so most common metastasis is the pulmonary. The so lung metastasis is uh, commonly occurring. So if we give the score of zero, whereas to spleen and kidney, we give score one for gastrointestinal two and for liver and brain, it is considered high risk GTN. So there the score increases to four. And uh, the number of metastasis uh, from one to four, we have um, score one and five to eight and more than eight. And previous failed chemotherapy, if it is a single drug regimen failure, we give the score of two. And if multi-drug, it is given a score of four. So we assess all these and we give the total score. When the total score is less than six, it is considered to be a lower risk GTN. And the survival rate is around uh, 90 to 100%. And uh, in, high risk, um, in high risk, the total score exceeds six. So when score is less than six, low risk, and uh, more, than seven, more than six is high risk GTN. So this is the categorization we follow uh, by uh, FIGO. So we have low risk GTN, high risk GTN and ultra high risk GTN. So low risk GTN, the anatomical staging one comes under low risk and whereas for stage two and three with the prognostic score less than six. So this falls under the category of low risk GTN. For high risk, when the uh, stage two and three with the prognostic score more than six and stage four uh, fully comes under the high risk. And with the high risk, when the score exceeds 13, we uh, tell it to be a ultra high risk GTN. So coming to the management uh, of low risk GTN. So here uh, we can, uh, it is very easily curable and uh, the cure rate approaches to 100%. Um, so here the management depends upon the patient uh, fertility status. So if the patient wants to retain her uh, fertility of younger age, then we can go ahead with a single agent chemotherapy. And if the patient is older and uh, if she doesn't want to retain her fertility, then we can go ahead with early hysterectomy. But we need to follow up um, with the HCG monitoring as well as adjuvant chemotherapy has to be given, even if hysterectomy is done. 
so uh, and the for single agent chemotherapy we have uh, two uh, drugs methotrexate or actinomycin d so these are the regimens uh, commonly uh, commonly done so for methotrexate we have two regimens so one is five day regimen and another is eight day regimen so eight day regimen we alternate with folinic acid so we give uh, 50 mg that is 1 mg per kg body weight methotrexate is given intramuscularly on days 1 3 5 and 7 alternating with folinic acid oral dose 15 mg uh, that should be given 24 hours after the methotrexate is given so on the days 2 4 6 8 and this cycle entire cycle should be repeated every 2 weeks so this is one of the regimen for methotrexate another is five day regimen so for for, for five day we take the dose as 0.4 mg per kg Uh, it can be given intravenously or intramuscularly uh, for five days, and this to be repeated every two weeks. And for actinomycin D, we have two regimens. One is five day regimen, and another is pulse IV regimen. So pulse regimen, we give one point two five milligram per meter squared body surface area intravenously every two weeks, and uh, five day regimen, we give point five milligram IV. Uh, in IV for five days, and this to be repeated every two weeks. The other less effective regimens under single agent chemotherapy is the weekly intramuscular injection of methotrexate or a weekly IV infusion uh, every two weeks. These are very less effective regimens. So, uh, Gynec Oncology Group trial was uh, conducted in around two hundred to three hundred uh, low risk GTN women, and uh, they, uh, they, uh, the regimens followed. Uh, it resulted in a primary remission rate. Uh, so the highest primary remission rate is achieved with actinomycin D five day regimen. So it is around seventy seven to ninety four percent. And this uh, for methotrexate is also it's in very close uh, proximity to this regimen uh, remission rate. So methotrexate five day regimen it is from eighty seven to ninety three percent, and uh, eight day with folinic acid uh, it is uh, seventy four to ninety three percent. And whereas actinomycin D pulse uh, pulse regimen it is uh, the remission rate is little lower. Um, when compared with five day regimen, so it is sixty nine to ninety percent. So a uh, Cochrane review on the uh, all the um, randomized control trials conducted for the low risk GTN single uh, agent chemotherapy regimens. So they found that uh, based on this trial, they found that the actinomycin D regimen, that two uh, five day regimen, were uh, more likely to produce remission rate, primary remission. But uh, the problem with actinomycin D is that it is more toxic. And uh, there is a uh, very higher risk for serious side effects. Like uh, it is highly emetogenic, and alopecia, bone marrow suppression may occur with the actinomycin D. So this uh, these side effects limits its use. So NCCM guidelines, that is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, recently uh, in 2020 they gave the guideline as uh, for the low risk GTN management. We for uh, for low risk we can go ahead with the Uh, low dose and also uh, less toxic therapy. So we initially start with methotrexate regimen, either five day or eight day regimen. And if that is contraindicated in case of any uh, hepatic or renal compromise, methotrexate cannot be given. So in that cases, or if resistant develops to methotrexate, then we can switch over to five day actinomycin day regimen. And we need to monitor the HCG pattern either weekly or two weekly. But NCCN um, advises for two weekly HCG for low risk GTM. And uh, here, uh, the, we monitor with the HCG, and uh, after the HCG cycle, uh, HCG has been normalized. Uh, we uh, we go and NCCN says that we need to give additional two to three cycles of consolidation maintenance chemotherapy even after HCG normalize. And uh, when to decide to give the alternative therapy? So we started on methotrexate, and we follow up with uh, two weekly HCG. So uh, on follow up. Then the HCG has not fallen by at least ten percent over three cycles of uh, therapies, or when there is a raise of HCG more than ten percent over two cycles of therapy, or if toxicity develops, then we can switch over to the alternative therapy. Among the alternative, we can uh, prefer five day actinomycin D over the pulse regimen. And uh, when there is a HCG rise. We need to re-evaluate the patient uh, both clinically and uh, radiologically, and we give a new prognostic scoring, uh, new prognostic scoring, and we can put on the combination chemotherapy if uh, both the single agent uh, chemotherapy fails. And the other treatment options available for uh, low risk GTN for stage one disease when it is very confined to the uterus, and uh, we can go ahead with local uterine resection or hysterectomy. 
and uh, 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 when there is a vaginal metastasis in stage 2 we have uh, vaginal metastasis so uh, that uh, when the bleeding occurs from the metastasis points or when the, when the we are able to identify the metastasis sites uh, on the uh, vagina we can go ahead with the vaginal packing or wide local excision can be done and uh, in, ca uh, in case of severe bleeding we can go ahead with the uh, embolization of hypogastric arteries so these are the other treatment options um, told for uh, low risk dtn managements and uh, here the, for the low risk early hysterectomy it uh, it is very useful and uh, very adjuvant to, to the chemotherapy success rate so uh, here the cure rate approaches about 100% and the recurrence rate for low risk dtn is very less uh, less than 5% about the low risk uh, gtn management coming to high risk gtn so these uh, we have to go ahead with the multimodality therapy for optimal treatment so we uh, commonly use intensive combination chemotherapy with radiation or surgery or both so here unlike uh, low risk gtn um, early hysterectomy is not that useful for uh, high risk patient so we need to first uh, put on intensive combination chemotherapy and uh, then decide on the further uh, surgical management and uh, uh, high risk gtn cases has to be uh, referred to a specialist centers where uh, the uh, persons um, already uh, experienced in uh, managing the high risk gtn uh, will be uh, better to manage the high risk gtn cases so here the cure rate uh, if there is uh, stage 2 and 3 the cure rate for high risk gtn is around uh, 90% Whereas for stage four, it is seventy percent. So this is the most common uh, used um, intensive um, combination chemotherapy for high risk. So it is imaco regimen. So day one we uh, give etoposide, hundred uh, milligram per meter squared IV infusion uh, in saline over thirty minutes, and also actinomycin B point five milligram IV bolus. And methotrexate is given first, so 100 milligram per meter squared IV bolus, then 200 milligram meter squared IV infusion over 12 hours. So this is on day one. So day two, uh, along with etoposide and actinomycin, the same regimen, we give alternate with folinic acid, 15 milligram IM every 12 hours. So total four doses, and it should it should be started 24 hours after starting methotrexate. And uh, this is on the day two, and we uh, alternate with uh, core regimen on day eight. So day eight, we give cyclophosphamide, six hundred milligram per meter squared in uh, saline, and vincristin, one milligram per meter squared IV bolus. So the complete response rate for imaco regimen it approaches about sixty-two to seventy-eight percent, and the survival rate is highly uh, is high um, for about uh, eighty-five to ninety-four percent. So uh, uh, and we already told that we have to go for a multi-modality treatment in case of high-risk region. So along with intensive combination chemotherapy. Uh, the metastasis sites also has to be managed. So uh, the more common uh, metastasis sites for the high risk is the liver and brain. So liver metastasis, uh, we can go ahead with uh, hepatic resection or um, arterial hepatic artery embolization, or uh, we can give chemotherapy in hepatic arterial infusion. Uh, this can be tried. And uh, for brain metastasis, whole brain irradiation and uh, intrathecal methotrexate can be given, and uh, stereotactic surgeries and craniotomy can be done for the. Brain metastasis. So when there is a resistance for imaco regimen, then we can go ahead with the salvage therapy, which is commonly used as the IMA EP regimen. So IMA EP regimen, this uh, IMA is the same as that of imaco uh, on day one and day two, the same dosage as uh, as already we discussed. And the day eight, the difference comes. So instead of cyclophosphamide and vincristin, we give cisplatin and etoposide. So cisplatin, sixty milligram per meter squared IV with prehydration. And etoposide, hundred milligram per meter squared by infusion uh, over thirty minutes. And the complete response rate for IMA EP is uh, still higher than IMACO. It is around seventy-five to eighty-five percent. So why we uh, prefer IMACO is that uh, when when there is a long exposure to the um, etoposide, uh, there is a risk of um, uh, premature menopause. Uh, along, uh, with the EMA EP regimen, and also bone marrow suppression is very high with uh, etoposide. So first we prefer imaco, and if there is any uh, uh, resistant develops, then we can go ahead with the EMA EP regimens. And there are several salvage regimens available for the rest.
consistent uh, high risk gtn like uh, uh, instead of maep we can give us ep eme or uh, paclitaxel so this is also it is on rising trend so uh, paclitaxel is platinum and etoposide tpte regimen and triple therapy which was previously used uh, methotrexate bleomycin and etoposide um, and uh, isophosphamide and the uh, bep regimen and fluoroxidin or pifluorouracil regimens are all available and uh, the other on the rising trend and under trial are the uh, high dose chemotherapy with autologous bone marrow or uh, stem cell transplant has been tried and uh, immunotherapy is also in, uh, on rise so uh, we need uh, we will see on uh, Uh, point on immunotherapy so uh, in gtn there is a high expression of the programmed cell death ligand 1 so immunotherapy by giving immunotherapy uh, it will act as a checkpoint inhibition by suppressing this death ligand 1 but and also it in uh, it enhances the native immunological response to the malignancies and the agents commonly used are under uh, which is under trial or pembrolizumab and avalumab uh, and uh, its role in gtn uh, remains to be established and uh, is under trial and uh, coming to ultra high risk gtn there is we already saw the in the prognostic score more than uh, 13 uh, with the uh, stage 3 and stage 4 then we declare it to be a ultra high risk gtn so here uh, there is a problem uh, of uh, massive tumor response so uh, they it can occur uh, like a tumor lysis syndrome or when catastrophic hemorrhages from the metastatic sites may occur uh, it can result in multiple organ failure myelosuppression sepsis and in the even we put on the imaco regimen early uh, in the treatment course uh, death may occur so uh, this is the problem with the ultra high risk so uh, uh, in studies they have found that uh, before switching over to the imaco regimen we can put on low dose induction chemotherapy with uh, cisplatin and etoposide so it will be a two uh, two day regimen so cisplatin 20 mg per meter squared and etoposide 100 mg per meter squared over in saline over iv infusion we can give it should be repeated weekly so uh, they say at least one to three cycles of uh, low dose induction chemotherapy before imaco um, the survival rate increases to 94 and also the death rate is very less with this uh, low, uh, low dose induction it is about 0.7% so when we compare uh, the ultra high risk uh, gtn when low dose induction therapy is given or not so if not given the death rate is higher in only in the treatment course whereas with low dose induction therapy followed by imaco the death rate Uh, reduced and it has come around 0.7 percent. And about uh, monitoring, uh, the high risk. Uh, so, like the low risk GTN, the the monitoring pattern the same as that of uh, low risk and high risk. So, uh, we have to uh, monitor the HCG either uh, weekly or uh, two weekly. And um, the till the HCG gets normalized, we have to continue the chemotherapy cycles every two weeks. and uh, once the hcg gets normalized we need to put on two to three additional courses of maintenance chemotherapy and uh, the recurrence rate of high risk gtn is around 12.5% so for low risk the recurrence rate was less than 5% and high risk uh, gtn it is the recurrence rate is 12.5% so here uh, it is attributed to the large volume disease disseminated diseases and uh, when the initial therapy was inappropriate it can result in the recurrence And about uh, the general follow up for GTN for uh, uh, both uh, low risk and uh, high risk uh, HCG pattern has to be uh, monitored two weekly during the first three months of remission, and uh, then we can go ahead with the monthly HCG till twelve months. And during the chemotherapy as well as the remission period, we have to uh, strictly follow on the contraception. So preferably oral contraceptives are used. So the reason behind that is that. Uh, oral contraceptive pills they suppress the um, um, LH as well as FSH. So uh, uh, since the uh, molecules are in uh, same identity to, uh, between the uh, LH and um, HCG, so uh, that suppresses the LH and FSH. So it will uh, it will not interfere with the HCG assay. So that is the reason why oral contraceptive pills are preferred for contraception uh, in GTN follow up period. And uh, the figures say uh, the future fertility and uh, pregnancy and offspring after treatment of GTN it is not affected. And uh, certain studies have shown that uh, there is a slight increase of about one point seven percent of uh, stillbirth uh, in the post GTN pregnancy. But it is uh, uh, found to be negligible, so we can uh, uh, we can advise uh, during the follow period and remission period they have to follow strict contraception. and after that we can allow for the uh, future pregnancy 
and uh, the ITT management, uh, that is the PSTT and uh, ETT, so management differs here. Uh, what is the difference is that the WHO prognostic scoring is not valid for the uh, intermediate trophoblast tumors. So uh, uh, we, uh, they take two prognostic factors for, uh, for, a bad, for a high risk category for ITT. The two factors are advanced stage disease, that is a uh, very uh, high mitotic count and uh, very uh, disseminated diseases and uh, invasive lesions and high um, lymphovascular invasion. If that is present, that is uh, declared to be an advanced stage disease. And this is one of the factors. And another factor is that when the interval between the pregnant, from the pregnancy even to the ITT uh, management, when it is more than 48 months, it is also a poor prognosis factor for ITT. Coming to the treatment, uh, when uh, I, uh, mostly uh, it will be uh, uh, non-metastatic, but sometimes it can be metastatic. Uh, when ITT is very localized and confined to the uterus without any uh, evidence of metastasis, then we can go ahead with hysterectomy with lymph node dissection, followed by uh, chemotherapy if needed. And if med surplus, though they are uh, chemo resistance, uh, certain regimens uh, are found to be effective and uh, they, we have to put on intensive chemotherapy like EMA, EP or paclitaxel related uh, regimens like TPTE. And here, uh, the surveillance mechanism, uh, uh, they, they produce very scant amount of HCG. So the surveillance mechanism will be with HCG monitoring or if the, um, if the physician feels that the HCG is not reliable, then we can go ahead with the imaging surveillance. Like uh, we can do a PET scan or CT scan uh, every uh, six months or every year for uh, two to three years following, following the management. So here uh, the survival rate for ITT, it is uh, when uh, it is non-metastatic, it is close to 100% uh, with hysterectomy. And uh, if metastasis is plus, the survival rate is reduced to 50 to 60%. And a point on twice and GTN. So uh, sometimes the GTN uh, may present with persistent low level of HCG that is less than 500 milli international units per ml. So here, even after extensive radiological and clinical evaluation, uh, that fails to uh, give any lesion. So uh, here we have to go for a, a close follow up and monitoring. And uh, sometimes uh, it, it can regress, but uh, around 6 to 10% may relapse and they develop into active disease. At that time, the HCG raises. And uh, at the, uh, for the relapse cases, chemotherapy again will prove to be effective. And about uh, since we are very much reliable on HCG for monitoring as well as for follow up. Uh, so we need to be very careful in assaying the uh, HCG. So we have phantom HCG patterns, like false positive HCGs can occur. So this may be due to a presence of heterophilic antibodies in the testing kits, or it can be uh, like uh, LH uh, stimulated. These are the reasons for the false positive phantom HCG. So this is the lab algorithm for uh, diagnosing between true positive or false positive HCG. So a simple test uh, can differentiate uh, phantom as well as true. So it, it is nothing but urine HCG. So when we do a urine HCG, simultaneous urine HCG along with serum, when urine HCG is negative, then it can be for false positive HCG. But when urine is positive, urine HCG is positive, then it is, we have to take it as a true positive HCG. And another method is by serial dilutions can be done in the serum or they can, uh, uh, they can uh, try different methodologies for assaying the HCG. Like uh, uh, we have different methods like radio immunoassay and immunoradiometric assays, which is very sensitive. So we can try different methodologies and there is uh, any difference, then it can be a false positive HCG. Or uh, along with heterophilic antibody tube, when we do a HCG, so obviously a phantom HCG will show as positive. So um, these are all the false positive HCG um, algorithm. And another point is uh, the phantom HCG in uh, GTN is that when we compare the normal pregnancy HCG molecules uh, with GTN, so in GTN, uh, the HCG molecules uh, it can be intact and also it can be more degraded or heterogeneous HCG molecules may also be present, like uh, free, beta, free beta HCG, core HCG, nicked HCG, and uh, B core fragments or uh, hypoglycosylated HCG. These are all also present in case of GTN. So we need to be uh, we need to make sure that uh, an assay that will detect both the intact HCG and all these heterogeneous metabolites has to be done. So uh, in order to accurately assess the tumor burden, so that uh, correct follow up and correct therapies will uh, reach the patient. 
the final uh, take home message will be uh, so gtn it is uh, malignant but easily curable and uh, can follow any pregnancy even even molar or non molar and among these the invasive mole and choriocarcinoma chemotherapy will be the primary modality uh, since they are chemo sensitive whereas for pstd and etd surgery is the mode and uh, lungs are the most common metastasis site and we need to individualize the treatment uh, based on the risk factors so we have to categorize as low risk high risk and for low risk we can go ahead with the first uh, multi day methotrexate if that is contraindicated resistant then five day actinomycin d and uh, uh, early hysterectomy is useful in case of low risk and if both are resistant then we can go ahead with the uh, combination chemotherapy for high risk we have to put on intensive combination chemotherapy first as imaco then if resistant ima ep and other multi modality treatments for the metastasis sites and we need to follow up the patient after the hcg uh, after the primary remission occurs and hcg normalizes we need to follow up for 12 months and strict contraception is to be followed for the follow up period and remission period thank you so these are my references thank you shiva thank you shiva priya it was really an extensive extensive speech but uh, actually like uh, when we diagnose gtn we uh, get the help of a medical oncologist and uh, do the treatment but uh, we will be the primary physician so the challenge lies in diagnosing the gtn for which we rely upon the history of uh, persistence of bleeding after any molar or normal pregnancy and hcg values so the uh, practically important point is whether we are how we are going to diagnose it without missing and we have to assess the risk also as we as you showed in your early slides the risk assessment which is going uh, which is going to help us in counseling the patient about the treatment whether they have to be uh, with the oncologist or whether we are going to manage the single drug therapy it's very important and the greatest thing the uh, about this uh, gtn is it is absolutely curable it is a cancer that is absolutely curable and pregnancy is uh, possible even after that so that that is very important and from this uh, presentation what we have learned is uh, as madam said upt which is very cheaper is very important you also stress that point in your phantom hcg that if only uh, upt is positive it is going to be the real hcg it can be a phantom hcg when you have a serum hcg positive without a urine pregnancy test positive so madam chitra madam your uh, point is very well taken our uh, lesson for today is we will do upt at least uh, uh, if serum hcg is not affordable by the patient madam do you want to add to add some points ma'am nothing as usual shiva has completely covered the entire thing without any gap and uh, patas madhuri sada 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 she has really given a very good presentation uh, what i wanted to stress is that this occurs mainly this uh, topic i chose because uh, youngsters the reproductive age group only is mainly affected and it is 100% curable only thing the patients and the obstetrician should be aware of all the follow up monitoring is very very important in no other disease is this follow up so very important than this gtd so to all our juniors we have to insist that uh, follow up monitoring is very very important for this good uh, presentation okay thank you ma'am what else uh, anita should we find up thank you very much ma'am thank i thank uh, shield healthcare for all their support in sponsoring every and each and every general club meeting thank you so much and i hope you continue to do so thank you chitrakala thank you thank you